was church. Let's get home and go home from here. We have done church. Amen. Amen. Today, I want to share with you, and I hope I'll be able to finish, um, a title of a message. Um, let me read for us first from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. It says, Now, a person who is in charge as a manager must be faithful. Anybody who is in charge as a manager must be found faithful. I read the second scripture in Psalm 68, verse 11. It says, The Lord gives the word, and a great army brings the good news. So God gives his word, and a great army, who the church is supposed to be, will take that word, as, at, as it were, as good news into people's lives. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, I want to share with us on a title that is called Understanding the Value of Spiritual Growth. Understanding the Value of Spiritual Growth. This is on the back of the study that we have been doing in our Sunday lounge. This month, we've been learning about growing in the scriptures, growing in the word of God, understanding and knowing how to commit the word of God into our lives and learn them in a profuse manner so that they can be a blessing into us. I want to use this time to commend the team that is leading this um, this. Um, these teachings, um, either preparing the materials, but also those who are teaching the materials at our, our Saturday lounge. I want to pray that God indeed will bless you. And those who have been attending, I also know that God is enriching your life. And I pray that you will see value in what you are getting in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Understanding the value of spiritual growth. There are various reasons why people go to church. I did a quick exercise this morning and I penciled down 12 reasons which are not exhausted. The ones I have here is, number one, people go to church to pray to God. Of course, you go to Tesco to shop. People have figured out that all the things I had to do, I need to parley with God and pray to him so I can get them done for me. So people go to church to pray to God. People go to, God, to, to church to meet friends. People go to church to look for spouse, either for a wife or for a husband. Because they have heard that there are good people in church. If you want to marry right, go and marry in church. And they've done that. Some of us did. And we got the right thing. Amen. Some people go to church to learn about marriage and parenting. They want to know how to raise up their family. They want to know how to raise up their children so they can be God-fearing. So they go to church for all that. Number five, they go to church to learn how to make money. Isn't that good? You don't think so? I know some of you are here because you want to know, to know how can you make money. And it's good. In fact, I want you to make a lot of money. Praise God. So people go to church to learn how to make money. Number six, people go to church to know how to do business and promote their businesses, which is a fantastic thing. It's good to start a business and know how to market it and promote it. And then people go to church to know how to connect to good jobs. They know that the kind of people going to this church they seem to have good jobs. I want to be like them, so let me go and learn from them how to get a job like their own. People go to church for that. People number eight, people go to church to learn about government and politics, isn't it? People want to know how can I be one of the appointed leaders of societies in politics for God. In fact, I learn people also go to church to do church politics. Isn't it? There's something called church politics. And you know, church politics is one of the most terrible things that can happen in a church. 
Church is not meant to be governed by politics. Church is supposed to be governed by the counsel of God. And if that is not there, then there's no church. Amen? Number nine. People go to church to know how to deal with their enemies and if possible kill them. It's also good because if somebody is chasing you and won't let you have your life, um, you just sort them out, you know? And number 10, people go to church to learn about purpose and leadership. People go to church to know how to use their skills and volunteer to use those skills in the various ministries and departments that we have in church. Fantastic. Some of the world renowned singers, they will tell you that they started learning how to sing from the pews in the church. So they learn how to organize themselves and use those talents in churches. Church is a platform for them to practice. I mean, church is like a guinea pig area where you can try all the things that you have and get better at it and know how to do it very well. Number 12, people go to church to gain experience and learn how to develop new skills. So people who come to church without any skill, they stay in church long enough, they pick up one or two skills, and they know how to do it and even do it well. All these reasons are good. Amen? But they are not good enough. If you do any of these things or all of these things, and then you lack in, the, in what we are talking about today as a real reason of going to church, then you are wasting your time going to church. You are wasting your time going to church because there are other places, other organizations that you can go to where you can find how to do these things. Every one of these things that even do it better. The real purpose of going to church must be for spiritual growth. Somebody say spiritual growth. The real reason we go to church, the real reason you must be here with your attention focused on what I'm saying to you this morning is for spiritual growth. The local church is not an organization. The local church is not a charity. I know that in the United Kingdom, most of the migrant churches, apart from the state church, they are categorized under charity organization. But we are not a charity organization. The local church is a spiritual family, and God is the head of that family. Somebody say amen. amen. The local church is a spiritual family. And the God Almighty who we serve is the head of that family. Now I know some people, some pastors, make you feel as though their surname is church. They make you feel as though they actually make church and they are the reason why church is existing. No, don't believe them. The reason for church is in God. And only God have the secret and all that he wants to achieve with the church. No, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, verse 12 and 13 tells us that their responsibility, that means the responsibility of pastors and leaders, said their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church and I mean, build up the church, the body of Christ. Verse 13 says, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's sons that we will be matured in the Lord, measuring up the, to the full and complete standard of Christ. The sole purpose of leaders and pastors in church is to train people to be spiritually matured in Christ. And that is what, someone like me, that is what I am determined to do and to do passionately. I want to see people come into God's fold and become matured in Christ. 
found their understanding and identity in the nature of Christ. It's good to go and learn how to make money in church. But if you make the money and the money is not good for God, it is a, it's not a good money. And I want to say that everything that you learn in church must be that you want to do it and learn it to do exactly as God wants us to do. Understanding purpose and value of church, of money, of being a pastor, of where we pray, of your position in church, all these things, they are very important, they are very crucial. And unless you attach a value to them, you abuse them. Unless you attach a value to the subject of money, to the subject of prayer. Do you know people abuse prayer? People think once they kneel down and just say anything, regardless of what it is, they should have it. No. That you say it does not guarantee. If you say what God will not do, there's no how you pray it long enough that God will do it. You can't bribe God. You can harass him. You can't intimidate him. He's in a class of his own. You can't shout at him. I know some of us, we love shouting to pray and tell God how to do it and when to do it. It doesn't move God. God wants us to learn that the most important thing about our relationship in him is to grow into maturity in the nature of Christ. Anything you do not know or attach a value to, I repeat that, you will abuse it. Another thing about value is that value or everything about value is that value is hidden, often hidden. You don't see value just walking around and commonly saying everywhere. It takes an effort to discover value about everything and anything. Examples. When you see an egg, just egg, the value of the egg is not the shell that you see around it. The value of the egg is inside the egg. And I haven't seen anybody who took one egg without peeling off the shell and just start grabbing it. No. You remove, you took an effort to take away the shell. That's a very simple example. Most fruits have a, sh a covering, a covering around it that we peel off. We peel it off and then we have the fruit inside. There's a little bit of effort that you put into place to discover value. Mineral treasures are buried in the belly of the earth. And you see miners, though that study um, ge geology, yeah, the manuals and the rest of them. You go deep down to explore all those hidden treasures. Why? Because they are buried in the belly of the earth. So you've got to do an effort to, to go and search for them where they are. The greatest focus and asset of a church is not numerical growth. The greatest effort and strength of a church is not numerical growth in numbers of, of members or of workers. The greatest asset is spiritual growth of its members. Any church that is not serious or not concerned about the spiritual growth of its members is a dangerous place to be. Because you do everything right in those lists that I've mentioned and you find out that you don't have anything called relationship with God. And that would be so sad. Haven't been to church all our lives and found out that we are not even on the side of God. God forbid, Amen. Spiritual growth allows you to carry the signature of the local church where you go. 
not just the local church, it allows you to carry the signature of the kingdom of God. When you get into a church and you begin to grow spiritually, you find out that the vision of that church, if given by God, will be written on your tab- in the tablet of your inside. You will know the vision of that church, not just the vision of that church, but the vision of the kingdom of God and how it connects. If, for example, you've been coming to this church and you don't know the vision of this church, you need to find out. Because if you have been long enough here, you will have discovered through what we say, through how we say it, through how we behave, through how we act, that this is the vision of this church. And this is the connection with God. If you have not discovered that, or if that does not bother you, or you are not interested in that, then something is not adding up. I've got to have a discussion with you. The more you grow, the more it will reflect in the efficiency of your service in the local church and in the kingdom of God. When you begin begin to grow spiritually, when you start to serve, you will serve efficiently. You will not just be working as though you want to just do a task. You will be working in a way that it will be meaningful to you, meaningful to the church, and meaningful to the kingdom of God. You will find out your role so that your role will become meaningful to you. You know, if you, if you have, I mean, there are three key major cutleries that we use to eat. A fork, a knife, and a spoon. Every one of those three stuffs, they have what they do. Have you tried to eat with a knife before? I mean, to actually put the food in your mouth. Because the knife is not meant to be used to, you know, to scoop the food in your mouth. The knife is meant to cut into portions that you can pick with your fork and you can have it into your mouth. Now, I know some of us prefer to actually use the spoon. It's okay. There's no problem with that. But if you go and eat in some places and you carry the spoon, they will look at you somehow. They will look at you somehow. They will do their glasses like this and say, where are you coming from? When did you land? And I've, I've tried, you know, I sat my sons down and touched them because I don't want them to disgrace me. I taught them how to eat at the table. There's also a place you must put your, 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 your cup, your glass. Some of you, it doesn't matter. You just, can just pick any, any, any cup on the table. You wouldn't know when you pick somebody else's table. I mean, I mean I've been to where before. I mean, somebody took your, your cup and you're wondering. <laughs> Excuse me, that is my drink you are having. They don't even take note of it. They take, and when they realize, they just took the, the other one and passed it on to you. No, 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 no. There's etiquette in anything that we do. There's a way we must do things. Actually, there was a time, remember Pastor Tony, there was a time on a Sunday we actually taught ourselves, we set up the stage and taught people because people will not come to such meeting because they don't want you to know that they don't know how to use it. So we set it up and we said, this is how you use it. When you get home, go and practice it. It's good. If you go and do it wrongly outside, don't say you're a member of Kingsborough. I would deny you. I would deny you. So I'm saying it now. Go and let on the YouTube. You can learn how to eat with curtsy. On YouTube, you can do all those things. How to hold the cup. I mean, there was a guy we know. The way he handles the fork, you think he wants to, I mean, he, he wants to actually plaster a wall with cement. He carries the thing and Tony and I would say, what's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this guy? You need to understand how to do stuff and do it correctly. This morning, what we are saying 
is that if you are good with the understanding of how to grow spiritually in the church, you'll be efficient in what you're doing in the church. Even you, you will know that I am a worker. I am a worker for God. When Paul is saying to himself that I do speaking in tongues more than all of you, he knows what he was saying. He knows I'm not a useless worker. I'm a good worker. And when I walk, I walk with efficiency. Efficiency has effectiveness and also delivery of purpose, of, pro of process inside of it. Many of you are managers here and you are managers of process at your places of work. We do that in church too. Let me share with you four elements of spiritual growth from this perspective of the disciples and the standard they lay down for us. Number one, if you want to grow spiritually in the church, you must examine your love life. Now listen before you run off. When I mean your love life, I mean your love in accordance to the way that God discerned law of love in us. You read that in 1 John 4, 7 to 21. Now, I don't have time to read it. But if you go there, what you're going to learn from that passage from verse 7 to 21 is that it tells you how to discern the love of God. But not to discern it alone. It also teaches you how to access it and replicate it into the lives of other people. So you learn how to receive God's love and how to give God's love to other people. If you are going to grow spiritually, you must understand that. If you cannot fathom how much God loves you, how much he, what he did, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved us, and if you cannot fathom that love that God has for you, you will not be able to do things correctly. You know, there are people who, by the experience they have had, if you say to them that I am going to give you 10 pounds, they will not believe you. Even when you show them the 10 pounds, they won't believe you. Even when you give the 10 pounds to them, they won't believe you. Why? Because they sit thinking you're going to collect it back. Knowing and understanding God's love is something that you, you cannot use your brain to understand it. The Bible said, while we are yet sinners, he did what? He sent Jesus to die for us. You cannot understand it if you have always known that for you to receive favors, it must be good. Oh yes, that is the right thing. But in the mercy of God, in the way that his ways are so far away from our own ways, he says, even though you are in a, a, a really cranky person, I'm still going to love you. I will love you so much so that you'll be afraid. That's God. The ability to discern the love of God and to demonstrate it to others. You must visit it and understand it. Number two. If you want to grow spiritually, you must look into your strength of character. I wish I have like four hours to talk about this. The strength of your character is crucial. Weak character stands in the way of achieving spiritual growth. When you are spiritually weak in character, there's nothing that is possible to pass through you. The character will destroy it. Long ago, many years ago, when we were doing workers training, I remember Pastor Tony Rappo, he tells us, he says, if you are growing spiritually, the anointing of your life is growing so powerfully, you must make effort to grow your character. If your character is not growing, it is your character that will destroy the anointing. You can be so anointed 
that fire can be coming out of your mouth when you speak. But if character is not there, you destroy it. Character is the foundation of an effective use of the anointing of God. Listen to what Romans, Paul said to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And strength of character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Now it says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our heart with his love. Strength of character is a precious virtue. You must fight the fight of faith. To destroy any vulnerability in your character. Every single one of us, by reason of our upbringing, by reason of our experiences, we ask character, you know, we have character faults. But when we come into church, God finds a way to straighten up that character. He did that to the disciples. One after the other, he was dealing with them because he knew that all that he was pouring into them as virtues, as spiritual growth, their character was in the way. So he faced their character. I mean, Jesus offended Peter. And he says, warn to you if you are offended in me. Yeah. He knew that what was, I mean, he called his right hand man. He called him and said, Satan, Satan is on your head. Satan, Satan is the one that is moving in you. Jesus could have, I mean, Peter would have said, Jesus, me? Yes. But Jesus said to him, he said, don't be, don't be offended in me. Why? Because woe unto him. I'm trying to achieve something in you that you need to work on to achieve and attain. Any character vulnerability in our lives, you and I must work tirelessly to make sure that we get rid of it. Because if we don't get rid of, of, of it, it will get rid of us. Amen? Amen? Number three, you must also visit your value system if you want to grow spiritually. What are the things you place value on? What are the things you place, place value on? When you go to church, what catches your attention is when the pastor pushes with the anointing, pushes people down, and say, ah, the anointing there was powerful. Awesome. But as people are falling down and getting up, they are getting up with more demons. It doesn't make any good purpose. But there, are, there is a way that when you see people and you see them being warded with the word of God and the touch, the understanding of the word of God, and they are cleansed by the water and the anointing of the word of God. It does a lot of cleansing. Your value system. Let's see Galatians 5. 22 and 23. Say, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is no law against, I mean, there's no law against these things. Amen? Amen. It's important for you to know that all these fruit of the Spirit, they are embodied in a gift from God that you and I ought to embrace and allow to see in our lives. That's why there are some traits that when you see them in your life, you, you should be upset with, your, with yourself. Upset. 
Not that you should be upset about that thing especially. You should be upset that you are still allowing things like that to loik around your heart or your life. You must subdue the Cain, the Cain identity, the Cain personality in your life so that you can allow the nature of Abel to reign in your life. Cain and Abel represent two different anointings. There's an anointing for the honor to God and there's an anointing in Cain that disdain God. It's important for us to know. Do know that when, you, when somebody did something to you and you know what to say to answer them back and you refuse not to answer back, you tame yourself not to answer back, you know the Bible says is a better superiority than to answer back. It's better. That's what is meant by meekness or self-control. You, know, you mentioned self-control. Self I mean, you, when you see, there was an image I saw many years ago, actually on the social media, about a lion that was sleeping. A lion sleeping. And it was as if he was actually snoring. And then there was one monkey that took a, a slab of stick, wanting to go and wedge it on the head of the lion. Ah. I said to myself, I hope this is not true. Because this monkey is shish kebab. Shish kebab. You must understand how can you tame yourself? How can you control yourself? Sometimes when you're quiet, your quietness is not because you cannot talk. It's self-control. Your value system is very important. Number four, if you want to grow spiritually, you must check the level of your understanding. Understanding. You know, knowledge is powerful. Understanding is far better than knowledge. If you understand everything that you know, you'll be, you'll be an impossible person to come against. Many people have knowledge, but have very few, very limited understanding. One of the things that we need to do when we are working with God is to convert our understanding, no, convert our knowledge into understanding. That's why you have knowledge, you have understanding, and then you have wisdom. Understanding, I mean knowledge, you acquire information. Knowledge are only information, you acquire them. Then understanding now breaks it down for you to know the depth of those knowledge, how to apply them. Then you know what wisdom does. When you now have wisdom, when you come to a place where you need the knowledge to be applied, wisdom popped up in you and give you the counsel of how to apply them. So you must process how do you get knowledge, how do you get understanding, and how do you get wisdom. If you only acquire knowledge and forget about understanding and, and wisdom, you are good for nothing. Good for nothing. Colossians 1, 9 to 14 tells a lot more about that. Don't have time to read it, but want to give you that reference. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. I can read that. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil. But be mature in understanding matters of this kind. You must make attempt, very diligent attempt, to understand some things. If you don't understand them, you go back until you understand them. 
If you are really growing, it should not be difficult for you to direct people to grow. If you find it difficult to direct people to grow, you are not growing. All you have is information. If you are really growing, when people come near you, they must be growing. I know people who have knowledge, but when people when they come in contact with other people, rather than growing, those people retrogress. You know why? Because the people who come near them, they will just say, I don't have hope. Because those people will flout their knowledge at them, and the guys will just say, oh, if this is all it's going to take me to even try to be a Christian, I'll just go back to where I'm coming from. That's not good. People must see you, and by the understanding of how you do it, they must be attracted to want to be the same. That's why the, what the Word of God teaches us. It is an embarrassment not to deliberately align with the core of what the Word of God says and what the vision that God might have given a local assembly to walk in is an embarrassment when you see somebody who is flouting it and yet says they want to be part of it. No. That's why, you know, in, in Romans 12, it says, it's an reasonable service to God to walk and lead a life of transformation, not a life of conformity. Amen? When you are conforming to the standard of the world, it's not good. It's not good. The work of a visionary is to write the vision and make it plain so that people that see it will run with it. The most important thing that I do in Kingsborough as a church is to make sure the vision is plain. So when you see it, you say, this one is mine. This one has my DNA. This one has my NI. This one has my blueprint. I'm going to run with it and I'm going to pursue it because in it is the victory that I have in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Lastly, if you would like to grow spiritually, you must also understand the outwork of the power of God in your life. You must take note of when the power of God is at work in you. There's nobody that the power of God cannot work in. I'm going to repeat that. There's nobody that the power of God cannot work through or work with if you allow God. Some people make you feel as if if only them pray for you, that's the only way you can get breakthrough. It's a lie. The day you learn to kneel down before God and call upon God like Jabez did, like that woman did, to the judge and say, I will not live here until you sort me out. I will so disturb you, you'll be having nightmares. I can tell you, heaven will respond to you. Heaven will respond to you. Acts 2 2 is a scripture for you to know. Genesis 49 22, you'll find out something gracious there, and even verse 26, Genesis 49. 22 and 26, it talks about the power of God in the life of Joseph. Read it. It will challenge you. You will see that. In fact, let me read that verse 26. It says, many fatherly blessing, it says, may my fatherly blessing be on you and surpass the blessing of my ancestors, reaching to the height of the eternal hills. May this blessing rest on the head of Joseph. For it is a prince, for who is a prince among his brothers? God can single you out and bless you in a way that you will be, you will out bless everybody. Amen? Amen? If you spiritually grow, I'm going to continue this message next Sunday. But I want you to take note of this fact that if you spiritually grow, it brings dividends. It brings reward. 
you will not only see the reward, people around you will see it. You can't hide it. When people see you, they will, you will stand out. Why? Because it will bring some added advantages in your life that will make you to be an envy of anybody that comes around you. I mean, I won't go into it. Let me just give us some things to pray about before next Sunday. Number one, pray that God will give you insight into the value and the grace of your life that is still being hidden from you being, or being hidden from you. There are some things about your life and my life that if we discover it today, we will live differently. So, your first prayer is, God, open my eyes to see these hidden things, these hidden values, these hidden treasures, this hidden grace that I'm yet to find out. There are some things that if you know it now, Boris Johnson will send for you. If they know that you know that thing. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, will send for you. If they know you know that thing, they will send for you. Know how they send for... What's this guy's name? That was living in Lodiba. In Lodiba? Mephibosheth. They went to look for him. When the king said, I needed him, I just want, I want to bless him. They went to look. The Boris Johnson will send for you. Not only Boris Johnson. And at the UN, they will say, let us go and look for him. Or her. Second prayer. I want you to pray and say, oh God, give me understanding of my role and my grace and the grace to make me put it to best use. Give me the understanding of my role and the grace to make me put it to the best use in your work. If you know your role, when that role is not being fulfilled, you will know. You know that you, you are letting the ball down. My prayer is that your position and your role will not be empty. In the scheme of the kingdom of God, it won't be empty. Number three, the last prayer point I want to give to you is, Lord, help me so that my character does not stop the fulfillment of my destiny. Let your character, let my character not stop the agenda of God in our lives. If you deal with character, you deal with everything. You know, there are people who are dealing with God, who are engaged with God, who are still double dealing. Do, you know, one leg here, one leg there. One leg here, one leg there. No, 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 no. If you understand your role and how God takes you, you wouldn't do that. Amen? Amen. Let's bow down our heads and pray. Why not ask God today and say, God, I've heard your word. Thank you for sending into our pathway today the desire to grow spiritually. The reason for us to live a life of growth in your son, Christ Jesus. Now pray and say, God, help me. Maybe you know where you needed help. Or even if you don't know, say, God, I need you to help me to identify the loopholes in my life. Identified in loopholes in my journey of faith. I don't want to be left out. Lord God, I pray. And as we partake in this communion today, Lord, we ask that you bless this communion emblems. Thank you, God, for the desire for us to continually be washed by the word of your mouth. The word you spoke, you spoke into, you, into being, oh God, for us. We ask, O oh God, that you bless these emblems of communion. And at this table, as we share this communion today, 
let our lives be enriched by you. We thank you, O God. We bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. The ministers are going to help us. Please take one of the emblems. We'll just share quickly as we round up the service. Please take one. And in the atmosphere of joy, my intention was not to make you feel somber by this message. I want you to actually feel enlightened and joyful that you are discovering what you need to know. Amen? So pray as we are going to have this communion that God, thank you for what you have given me today. I ask, O oh God, that you enable me to know how to put it to best use. In the name of Jesus. I can tell you, you are going to high places. But God doesn't want you to go there and get there and fail. He wants you to get there and shine. The character of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their uncle Daniel made them to shine in Babylon. They got to Babylon. Everywhere they got to, they were shining. Why? Because their character has been dealt with. Their character was not in the way of their destiny. Pray today and say, God, the anointing of David, the anointing of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the anointing of Daniel, let it come upon me. Help me, O God. Pray. Pray that amongst your peers, wherever you go, you will excel. You will not be a rich enough. You will not be a, no, a nobody. Lord, we give you praise. We honor you, Lord. We appreciate you. Those of us who are at home, we hope you have your communion emblem as well. If you have the flakes and wine, good. If you're using biscuit, if you're using bread, whatever it is that you feel right to you, Rabina is fantastic. Let's just partake together today again in the sharing of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure everyone has as ready. Let's just pray. Father God, we thank you for the joy of partaking again at the table of this Holy Communion. Thank you for the body of Jesus that was shared at the cross that was broken for us. The Bible said on the same night that he was crucified, he took the bread and broke it. And he says to his disciples, this is my body that is broken for you to take your place. He said, draw near and receive and do this as often as you will in remembrance of what I did. Father God, we remember the victory that you wrought for us at Calvary. We walk in that victory today to cause us to grow spiritually and in understanding and maturity, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. the same way he took the cup father God we ask that you bless this cup of this communion even though we drink from various and different cups it is one same cup in the blood of Jesus we drink from it today to receive the life that comes from this blood let this life flows into our lives from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet in the mighty name of Jesus. We receive victory, dominion, and we receive testimonies from it, O oh God, in Jesus' name. For we shall be your ambassadors here on earth and we shall show forth your glory in this world. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Receive the blood of Jesus. Father God, we thank you so much. We bless you and we honor you. I will see you again next Sunday. By God's grace, we'll be able to finish it. But I want you to please pray those prayers.